The doctor who provided an abortion for a 10 year old rape victim is now suing the Attorney General of Indiana for defaming her and her rep, uh, reputation. As Todd Rokita had, uh, in, as the story was coming out, immediately began attempting to downplay it, implying that the facts of the story were wrong or to the extent that they were right, that the doctor was the person we should be angry at. Take a look at an appearance he had on Fox News. Then we have this abortion activist acting as a doctor with a history of failing to report. So we're gathering the information, we're gathering the evidence as we speak, and we're gonna fight this to the end, including looking at her licensure if she failed to report. And in Indiana, it's a crime for to not report, to intentionally not report. Okay, so look, there's obviously a lot of issues with that video. The fact that the attorney general finds out that this horrific act has happened, um, that it is compounded by the fact that the law there in Ohio is incredibly uh, barbaric. The thing he's fired up about is supposedly issues with this doctor's reporting of facts about the case, about the timeline. That's the thing that he thinks needs to be investigated. Not the actual crime itself, which created the situation, not the legislative act action in Ohio that compounded it, that made it far worse, that necessitated the 10 year old rape victim having to flee across state lines, just the doctor. And of course, it's even worse because he's not even right about the things he's attempting to distract you with. Uh, just the next day, health officials in Indiana released a document contradicting Rokita's claim, which you saw uh, there on Fox News, demonstrating that uh, Caitlin Bernard, who's the doctor in this case, had reported the procedure on the 2nd of July. In that report, she said she'd provided a medication abortion to a 10 year old abuse victim on June 30th, who was approximately six weeks pregnant. Indiana University Health, which uh, employs the doctor, has also said it conducted a review and determined she had not violated any privacy laws. And so he immediately began defaming her, implying not only that she had committed some sort of legal act in this case, but that she had some sort of history of this. And so thus the lawsuit, in fact, her attorney sent a letter to him saying her client had suffered harm because of his public statements about her, of which you have now seen. Uh, Kathleen Delaney, the lawyer says statements that Dr. Bernard uh, has a history of failing to report, which Mr. Rokita indicated would constitute a crime made in the absence of reasonable investigation or any investigation whatsoever, let's be clear, serve no legitimate law enforcement purpose. Given the current political atmosphere in the United States, Mr. Rokita's comments were intended to heighten public condemnation of Dr. Bernard, who legally provided legitimate medical care. Um, the, the lawyer saying intended there, of course, is uh, that's what the, they think. And it seems like the clearest thing in the world, Jessica, that they were attempting to get people angry at this doctor. But also that that was just a tool of the larger effort to have people not think about the fact that a 10 year old was forced to flee a state to deal with the product of the rape she had suffered. But that you should be angry about this doctor instead for some sort of bureaucratic thing. Right, absolutely. And this case is not unique. It's not like this anomaly that happened at a time when it was convenient for you know the left to take this story and talk about it and make the case for why abortion is a necessary right. Uh, that's absolutely not, not the case. The right wants to make it seem that way. But in Ohio, on average, someone under the age of 15 children have had abortions, 52 in a year, so one per week. That's a lot. This is something that occurs really frequently. They should do something to address that. Rather than criminalizing the doctor, it's absolutely insane the misfocus here. If they actually cared about children, if they actually cared about the right to life or the, the right to good quality life or the life after it's been born, they would care a lot about those those children. But of course, they're focusing the conversation on the doctor. Exactly. Yeah, you know, I'm glad that you cited that statistic too, that um, you know, we are probably averaging about one case like this per week. Now, of course, this is it's been more than a week. Since this story came out, and you know, I get that the national news is not going to track down every story like this in the same way that they're not going to focus on every mass shooting. America is a country that is so fundamentally broken that it generates things that should dominate the national conversation far too often for it to be possible for them to. And yet, I have to wonder who is the you know on average one person who has had to deal with a situation like this because. We can't forget 
that the fundamental problem is Ohio law and the laws of many states. This sort of case could have happened in you know a couple dozen states probably. It can still happen. The horror that we should feel coming out of this case, what was revealed by this tragedy hasn't yet changed anything. It's still just as possible for it to happen. The only thing that's likely to have changed is the right might be a little bit less inclined to try to pretend that the story didn't exist. I believe that they're probably far more likely at this point to not engage with it at all. Like I, I don't think that they're gonna even pick this up. They tried to do their thing on Fox where they made it about something else. And once the facts came out, they pivoted to talking about um, you know, undocumented uh, migration. But I think in the future, they're just not going to engage with this because they know it's it's not a topic that they can win on. If people are thinking about the reality of the, the reproductive rights situation in these states, um, it's never gonna look good for them. Right, yeah, it's not gonna look good for them. But also, if you're the type of person who's defaming someone on national television, it's a great thing that this doctor is suing. I think doctors that perform abortion should be more litigious in times like these when people are saying terrible things about them on television because the settlement oftentimes in defamation lawsuits is money and the one thing members on the right care about, especially the grifters that go on you know, mainstream media from the right care about is money. This is the way you get at them. This is the way you make sure this doesn't happen again. Yeah, and you know, can we put up that B-roll that we just had up for a second? Because I think there's a part of this that isn't yet a part of the story, but I would love for it to become a part if we could throw that up. You see Todd Rokita there, but you also see Jesse Waters. Jesse Waters was all over this thing. Like, sure, other people at Fox, the Laura Ingrams and stuff like that, they did try to fool you into thinking that this horror hadn't happened, um, that it hadn't been made worse by choices made by a generally elected Republican men. Uh, but Jesse Waters was there the whole time. Now, maybe he was a bit more careful with his language. Maybe he didn't make the specific claims about lack of timely reporting like Todd Rokita did. But he definitely attempted to convince people that this story hadn't happened, that it's not something you should worry about, that it was all being cooked up by abortion activists or whatever. And of course, it's at a time when Fox News is already facing multiple defamation lawsuits, generally from corporations that were involved in the 2020 election. One would think they'd be a little bit more careful about that. As of right now, Jesse Waters isn't facing any sort of lawsuits or anything like that. As I said, maybe he's been more careful, but he was just as eager as Todd Rokita to misinform his audience intentionally about this, to use it for his own political ends. Yeah, and one last point on this, the, the congressional testimony from that anti-abortion activist where she said, well, in this case, it actually wouldn't be an abortion. The attorney general said in this case, it was justified. But then he's on Fox News bashing the doctor. The right is really falling apart around this issue where there are so many cases where they see it's very clear that there's a reason why abortion is you know, a, a medical procedure that is necessary and worth protecting. And they just can't defend themselves. They're absolutely falling mm-hmm. apart. It's insane to watch. Yeah, and, and that is one of the most telling bits of video that like, if it's justified, okay, you can do it, but it's no longer an abortion. But that just means they don't want to admit that they support abortions in some cases. That's it. it the procedure is the same. It, it of course has the same name. It's such it's such a weird like people reveal themselves. They reveal their thought process um, when you press them, and and they definitely did that. They know that their position isn't popular. Sure, it's popular amongst Fox News viewers uh, on the right, Republican primary bases, but. If they could have won this by convincing people, they would have done that. They wouldn't have set up a multi-decade scheme to pack the judiciary with uh, you know, Christian nationalist zealots. They know that nobody actually uh, agrees or certainly not enough to formulate a, a majority. Um, and so anyway, look, I think the Democratic plan to talk about this a lot, not really do much, but make sure that people have it on their mind in advance of the midterms, that bothers me. Deeply, because I think that if you are going to sell yourself as being a passionate defender of a set of rights, you should also be defending those rights, not just opining about it. Um, but I, I think it's not a terrible campaign strategy, um, and it's going to be interesting to see going forward how how the right is going to deal with this. I mean, we're, we had the story coming out of Texas of the you know the the woman who was forced to carry uh, the dead fetus for two weeks. Like when you set up an absolutely inhumane legal structure as they have in regard to reproductive rights. It is going to throw out 
unbearably cruel and horrific stories on a weekly basis, if not more. And we've already, it's only been a couple of weeks that so we've already experienced multiple of those. Right, yeah, not having Democrats do anything in the short term uh, and not really telling us what their plan is the long, in the long term either if we reelect them during the midterms. That's, that's not a winning strategy, I'm sorry, but everyday voters are not listening to what the Democratic Party is saying every day. And so unless you know they actually take action, what people are looking to is them doing something in the meantime. There are a lot of things they can do. AOC has been a great advocate for all of the things they could do in the meantime. They could build abortion clinics on federal lands. They could try again to codify Roe v. Wade into law. They could, you know, establish networks so that women can get access to abortion pills via the mail in states where, you know, abortion trigger laws have already gone into effect. But they're not really doing any of this. And instead, we're getting a bunch of fundraising emails from Nancy Pelosi. This is not going to get people to go out and show up to vote. Yeah. I think it's an effective strategy to say, like, hey, we're on the right side of this issue. But unless, like you said, you demonstrate that you're going to protect those values that you claim to have and protect those rights that are in line with your values, uh, your voters aren't gonna show up for you. Yeah, yeah, and you know, um, it opens up a possibility right now. So look, supposedly on some area, like I think in turn, we're gonna be talking about, you know, codifying the, the right to same sex marriage in a little bit. Uh, Schumer is saying that he's like working behind the scenes trying to get some Republicans on board or whatever. And I get that that's always the way that they're gonna pursue this. And it might be on some issues like trying to get the Senate to vote to codify reproductive rights. Um, they're probably not gonna do that. And so that provides an opportunity. I know that Democrats find the idea of forcing the right to actually filibuster to be unacceptable. They love the filibuster more than we love anything and yet they don't want people to have to filibuster when they filibuster. But think about if they were to force it right now, knowing what we know about support for reproductive rights, put it up for a vote. And if the right wants to filibuster it, then have them actually do that. Have them actually hold the floor for an hour and then a day and then a week and then the next three months if necessary. Have it be indisputable, a constant reminder of how out of step with the majority of the country, the right is. And, and honestly, do it because it's the right thing to do. But even if you don't have that in you, if you're so soulless in a political sense, then do it for political pragmatism. Have the months between now and the midterm elections be that constant reminder, an indisputable reminder that the Republican Party doesn't give a damn about, I don't know, 150 million Americans and what happens to them. But they're not gonna do that. They're gonna try to like wheel and deal behind the scenes. And if they can't make it happen, maybe they'll put it up for a vote once. It'll be filibustered in that they will just shut it down and then we'll move on. And that'll be it. it they're just so bad at the political side of this. Yeah, and it's been a long time since uh, Ted, Cruz, Ted Cruz read me a bedtime story. In 2013, mm -hmm. when he was reading Green Eggs and Ham, when they actually had to filibuster, when they didn't want things to go to a vote and they didn't want Obamacare to go to a vote. And so they had to get up on the mic and talk for hours and make fools of themselves. They did, yeah. and that's exactly what they should be forced to do right now. And I get nervous because it seems like Every time they have close to a margin or they have a margin in the House and in the Senate, there are always conveniently the exact amount of votes they have the margin of people who are wavering on the issues of the substantive legislation that we're voting on. Right now it's Mansion and Cinema when we're talking about Build Back Better and when we're talking about Roe v. Wade, we have people like Henry Cuellar. But it always feels like the Democrats are playing this game of maintaining the status quo and always ensuring that we have a few moderates that are willing you know, to not vote so that legislation doesn't pass. And let's keep in mind, people like Nancy Pelosi are benefiting from the status quo. She has a ton of money in stock right now, really teetering on the line of insider trading every single day with the stock holdings of her and her husband. It's just scary because they're benefiting from the way things are. They don't have, you know, a real inclination to make substantive change. That's really scary because even if we get those votes in the midterms, will anything happen? Exactly. Yeah. The the only thing I would add would be uh, moderates. Yeah. Um, because uh, you know, stripping you know, uh, 150 million people of their rights is is uh, hardly moderate. But they will always get the media will 
provide them with the immense benefit of implying that their position is naturally reasonable. Everyone else is a crazy ideologue, the, the position they hold politically, that's the only reasonable thing. Um, by the way, before we move on, I just wanna throw out a couple more things about this. Um, so Caitlin Bernard, the doctor who performed this abortion uh, is I, I, I think uh, understandably concerned about what can happen when you're demonized by the right over this. So last year, she testified in a case involving abortion restrictions in Indiana. Uh, she said that she was forced to stop providing first trimester, uh, first trimester abortions at a clinic in South Bend. Uh, she did that after she was alerted by Planned Parenthood uh, that a kidnapping threat had been made against her daughter and relayed to the FBI. So they were they, again, the pro-life people were implying that they would kidnap and potentially murder her daughter. Um, by the way, the names of six abortion providers as well as their educational backgrounds and places of work were listed on the website of a group, an anti-abortion group called Right to Life uh, Michiana in a section of the website titled local, local abortion threat. Her name was listed amongst other doctors there. And we know that the right periodically likes to um, threaten violence or bomb one of these clinics or try to burn them down or mur murder the doctors who are performing there. Again, the pro-life people like to murder these doctors. Um, by the way, that particular group, Supreme Court Justice Amy Coney Barrett had ties to it. So isn't that fun? They got one of their own on the Supreme Court and accomplished their goals that way. Anyway, finally, uh, on August 2nd, Kansas is going to be voting on a state constitutional amendment that would clarify that the state's Bill of Rights does not protect Kansans' uh, right to an abortion. As it stands right now, the judicial inter interpretation is that it does. This will not outlaw abortion there, but it is a prerequisite for them to outlaw abortion there. So stay tuned in the next couple of weeks to find out what happens in Kansas as well. I just don't understand Republicans conception of how our government works and democracy in this case, because they're totally in favor of amending state constitutions. People you know, who are elected to public office there can make a reasonable determination of how they should change the state constitution. But if we were to ever think about doing that at the national level, have the people who have been elected to, to represent the population there make substantive changes, it doesn't apply. So why is it that at the state level, this is an acceptable thing to do, but to have popular policy at the national level isn't? What is the yeah. mental disconnect that is happening there where that's okay? I don't know, I mean, look, there's a bunch of them. So it's possible I'm forgetting things, but I'm trying to think of like an amendment to the constitution that would be in their best interests. Like that they would be a fan of it. I mean, look, they love to talk about the second amendment, but of course when it was added, the clear text of it isn't anything like the way they understand it now, let alone expanding the vote and things like that. Yeah, generally amending the constitution has not worked well for the right.